So now we're going to hear from our next presenter, Victoria Quinesson, who is a graduate student studying fishery science at Oregon State University. She's going to discuss her path in marine science, including her undergraduate experience, what it's like to work in a lab, and her experience as a first generation graduate student. Way to go, Vic. She will also provide some insights on how she's currently working to develop mathematical and, co and computational tools to help address fisheries management and sea turtle survival in the face of climate change. So Victoria, go ahead and share your screen, turn on your, or unmute yourself, looks like you're there, and go ahead and begin your presentation. Awesome, uh, let me know if you can see what I want you to see, I and you see. can hear me, perfect. Yes. Hi everyone, it's so nice to kind of see you all here today. My name is Vic, short for Victoria. I'm a first year PhD student, so I'm kind of in the 19th grade at Oregon State University. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background about how I got to where I am, and then I'll, I'll talk about some cool research that I've done and, and will be starting to do soon. Um, so I always loved math since the third grade. I had a fantastic math teacher, her name was Mrs. O'Connor, and I always thought that I would grow up to be a math teacher. Um, but when I took biology classes in high school for the first time, I ended up falling in love with biology. And so when it was time to start applying for colleges, I decided to be a biology major. And I had always loved the ocean and everything that lived in it. So I, I felt like marine biology was a pretty safe option for me. I was a first generation American. So my parents are French and they moved here to America about five years before I was born. Um, so they had never been to college and they had certainly never been to college in the US. And so I couldn't really ask them for help for applications or anything like that. I actually had a friend who was, uh, her mom was able to sit down with me. And I remember uh, sitting down at the dining room table with her and taking notes and asking her all these questions. Um, and she kind of explains the whole application process to me and what a good school was and what a not good school was. Um, so that was really helpful having someone like that in my life that I could ask. Um, so for college, I started out as a marine biology major, and because I just kind of kept taking math classes, I figured I might as well add math as a major too. Um, but besides taking classes, the most important parts of college for me were, sorry, I was told to watch my phone and then someone tried to call me, but it wasn't them, so it's okay. I hope. Besides taking classes, the most important parts of college for me uh, were the study abroad courses that I was able to take in Colombia and Iceland. So that's the Colombian flag and the Iceland flag. Um, I got to make friends with students from both countries and also uh, students from England and got to learn from a lot of different professors from a lot of different institutions around the world. If anyone ever has the chance to study abroad, I would 100% recommend it. And there are a lot of scholarships out there that are meant for just study abroad. So it can be um, a little easier to pay for that than for usual studies sometimes. I also applied to and was accepted to a one week workshop in marine resources and population dynamics posted by NOAA. So essentially how you can use math and coding to help to help understand what's going on with different resources. So that could be like fish, that could be sea turtles, that could be lobsters out in the ocean. And then population dynamics, that's the study of how the population is changing over time. So if the population size is getting bigger, if it's safe, if it's going down, if it's uh, threatened or might be going extinct, um, that would all be based on population dynamics. You've got birth rates and death rates and growth and reproduction and all that fun stuff. That was actually my first introduction to population dynamics was that workshop. And I decided that that's what I wanted to work on. And so that's when I made up my mind that I wanted to keep going to school after I finished in college and start graduate school. Um, another really important thing that I did in undergrad was I started working in a lab my sophomore year, so my second year of undergrad. I was really lucky that I had the time to volunteer my first year, so I was not getting paid. I was doing a lot of dishes. I was doing a lot of the grunt work, pouring plates and sanitizing things and things like that. Um, but because I stayed in that lab for another two years, my advisor was actually able to pay me for those other two years. And I started actually helping out with experiments and I got to start running my own experiment the last year. So even though I didn't actually want to work with bacteria for the rest of my life, it was really great experience in learning how to run an experiment and collect data and make decisions about when to continue or stop or things like that. So it was really useful for me. If you do want to do research, if you, you know, get to college and you join a lab and you think that's a really awesome thing to do, 
start as early as you can. The longer you're in a specific spot, the more uh, experience you can gain and the further along that track you can go. And hopefully they can pay you for your time. Um, so I started applying to graduate schools in my last year of college, but I did not get in the first time. And that happens to a lot of people. So I took an impromptu gap year and I decided to do a service year. So essentially it's kind of like volunteering, but they give you a little bit of, of money. Um, and I served as an environmental educator with a nonprofit in Massachusetts called the Westport River Watershed Alliance. And so I was helping to lead educational programming. So if you've ever had a guest come into your middle school classroom or your elementary school classroom and lead a lesson on a local creatures or habitats or how to grow your own garden or how to identify local bird species, I was that person for a year. And so we had lessons for preschoolers all the way through high schoolers. We came into the classroom, we had field days with them, we did after school activities. Um, and I discovered a love of educational outreach that I am still pursuing in grad school. So I do a lot of work with middle schoolers in the area. Well, I did pre-COVID. I'm still trying to figure out how to do that right now. Um, but if I hadn't gotten rejected from graduate school that first time, and if I hadn't decided to do this for my gap year, I might never have known that. And so it was really nice to learn that about myself and it'll definitely influence what I want to do when I'm done with school. So after, during my service year, I took a lot more time to look around for places that I wanted to go for graduate school. And I spent a lot more time writing emails and cover letters and things like that to people who would potentially hire me. And so I found one who liked me and was willing to pay me. So it's hard to not only find people who want to work with you, but also have the money to pay for you. And it really helped um, having a strong background in math. So the fact that I took a lot of math classes and I had a math major, that was really helpful for me for finding an advisor who wanted to defend me. And I found an advisor whose teaching style matched my learning style, who was super supportive of me as a first generation graduate student. Um, essentially, I had a lot of questions and I didn't even know what I didn't know. So it was really nice having someone super supportive to help me through that whole process. And I was a little bit bummed because I've always wanted to work with sea turtles, um, but this project was for fish. But at least I was developing the tools, so learning how to code and write models, um, so I was developing the tools that I could later use for sea turtles if I had the opportunity. So even though I didn't get to work with my favorite study species, um, I was developing good tools for myself in the future. So I worked in a fisheries oceanography and population dynamics lab. So again, those population dynamics come up. So figuring out how to predict how much a population will grow or get smaller in size over time as reactions to how much we're fishing or other kinds of policies in the ocean. So in this case, I was looking specifically at how four different species of fish, so rockfish, lingcod, cabazon, and canary rockfish, um, would react to different kinds of management rules. So essentially, how many fish we're taking out every year and how to figure out how much is the right number of fish so that fishermen are still able to fish and make money and support their families but there's still enough fish left in the ocean that they'll, they will be able to do that in 20 years or in 50 years. Um, and I was looking at a new kind of reference point. So there's models out there um, that require calculating a whole bunch of data to be able to predict how much fish we can harvest every year, but not all species have enough data that you can calculate that. And so I was looking at a new kind of reference point that you don't need as much data for, but it does depend on having marine reserves. So those are places in the ocean where you absolutely cannot fish. And so if they're not being fished, you can kind of have more information about how big the stock should be compared to when there is fishing. And that can help you figure out how many fish you are supposed to take if you want the population to survive a long time. Um, and so it turns out that when you make new marine reserves, this was these were kind of the results from my study, you do have to take into account the fact that it takes time for the population to recover. So you can't just make a new marine reserve and then start using the new reference point because you have to wait for the population to recover before it's super effective. Um, and so this changes how we know we can use information from inside those marine reserves to help manage uh, fisheries inside and outside those marine reserves, um, especially for ones where we just don't have as much data. So maybe for smaller fisheries like uh, certain kinds of rockfish or newer fisheries where we just 
we haven't been catching them for very long, so we don't really know how many are out there. And so I'm just wrapping up this project, so I have to write it all up and I'm starting to go through the whole publication process, which is very confusing for me, but hopefully it will be a lot easier with practice. And I'm starting my PhD. So I'm using computer models again, but this time I get to work with my favorite study species, sea turtles. So I'm really excited about that. And so the problem for sea turtles is that they are temperature sex dependent. So you know how humans have X chromosomes and Y chromosomes, and that's and when the egg is fertilized, like that's it, it's gonna be a boy or a girl, uh, genetically speaking. Uh, green sea turtles don't work like that. Their sex is actually determined by the temperature of the nest. And so you have warmer nests produce more females and cooler nests produce more males. The issue though, is that as global climate change happens, nesting beaches are getting warmer. And so you have beaches that are producing more and more females and less and less males. In fact, there are some beaches uh, off the coast of Australia, so in the Great Barrier Reef system, that have been producing almost 100% females for 20 years already. And so if this continues, eventually there won't be enough males left for the population to survive. And so at what point does that happen? How many males is not enough males? And can sea turtles evolve fast enough to survive having fewer males? So maybe um, they could have some sort of genetic adaptation. So maybe there's a mutation in their DNA and that temperature switch gets a little higher. So then maybe even at those hotter temperatures, maybe we can still produce males or maybe they can change behaviorally. So maybe male sea turtles can travel farther to mate with females or maybe they can mate with more females. And then even if we don't have as many males, it's not as much of an issue because they're making up for it. And so again, I'll be using those computer models to help answer these questions. So I don't have any answers for you now on that one, but I can keep you all updated in the next few years. And so that's the end of my talk. So I'm happy to answer any questions that people might have about that. I know I went through that a little fast. Wonderful, Victoria. Thank you so much for sharing your story, how you got to be where you are um, and what you're currently working on. Uh, a one quick question is you're going to be, so the fun with computer modeling is you can take data, right? And you can use that data, to answer all kinds of questions and develop the scenarios, just like the scenarios you're talking about with the sea turtles. So I know you have, you don't have the answers for the sea turtles yet, but what, where's your data coming from? What kind of data sources are you using for your models? That's a great question. Um, so in order to answer that question, I have to have lots of information about sea turtles before I can even tell the computer to run models, right? I have to know how many babies they're having. I have to know, you know, how often males and females are mating and how many nests females are laying and how many eggs per nest. And I have to kind of be able to predict where the males are going and all that. And I don't have that data yet. And so this is actually work that I'll be collaborating with other scientists down off the coast of Brazil where there is a national park where they actually can observe what the males are doing and collect data on a specific population of green sea turtles. And then once I have all of these different relationships, once I know, you know, if I have this many females and this many males, then that gives me this many eggs of which this percentage will be female and this percentage will be male. Once I have all of that data, then I can plug it all into a computer model and have it run lots and lots and lots of simulations to see, you know, Maybe in 50% of the simulations, sea turtles will survive for 100 years, or maybe in 100% they will. And so my data will be coming from green sea turtles off the coast of Brazil. Fantastic. How cool is that? All of the data and then the click of a button, you can see it. Hundreds of scenarios. Yay, computer modeling. Okay, so a question about, um, do you by chance know if there are successful ca captive sea turtle reproduction programs? I am not aware of any that take the eggs and like release young into the wild. A lot of the sea turtles that are in zoos and aquariums that I know of are actually injured and cannot be rehabilitated and cannot be released because they would not survive in the wild. Um, so for example, there's a turtle, I think her name is Charlotte at the Baltimore Zoo and she has what's called bubble butt. So she has some air in the back of her body under her shell. And so it kind of causes her butt to float up above her head most of the time when she's swimming. And so she's not really able to feed properly. And so they kind of can't release her. So a lot of the sea turtles in captivity that I know of are mostly because they can't be released. It's really tricky to transport eggs, um, to bring them out from a nest in the wild into somewhere like a lab where you could control the temperature and things like that. Um, a lot of them will die in transport. And so that's really tricky. 
So I really hope there's programs out there, but I'm not familiar with any right now. Thank you for your insight. Thank you. Um, so question would be, so you do a lot of modeling with at your computer screen at your desk. Do you get to do field work? Well, unfortunately for part of my research, I do not. All of my time is spent at the computer. And so what I do in my off time is I volunteer. And so I volunteered, I got to go out once until, you know, COVID happened and then I couldn't go out anymore. Um, the Oregon Department of Fisheries and Wildlife has a marine reserves program for the five marine reserves we have off the coast. And they have biological volunteers that go out and help with sampling. And so you get to fish um, for a predetermined amount of time. They bring you out on a boat and they say, all right, you can start fishing now. And then they time you and they say, all right, stop fishing now. And so you're going out and you're helping fish and catch uh, these fish and then they mark species and how long they are and how many they caught in a day. Um, and we do that inside and outside the reserve. So I was able to go out and help um, actually collect some data that I would have used because that data would have gone into stock assessments. Um, but for part of my research, unfortunately, I get to stay stuck behind a computer. Even for the sea turtles, I would be volunteering my time to go down to Brazil to help with field work down there. But I will theoretically get to do that next December. So I'm very Great. excited about okay. that. I was going to ask, so you kind of started to allude to it. So how would the pandemic impact your ability to travel to Brazil and help collect some of that data? I guess. It's yeah, really so <laughs> hopefully the researchers down in Brazil are able to kind of get a head start on that because the project was supposed to start this year. I don't think that I will be able to travel down and help like I was supposed to in December. So I might either, it might either get pushed back to sometime next year, or I might not get to start until next December. Gotcha. All right. Well, honestly, I got to say, I know you say that you're stuck behind your desk, but the, the joy of these, these webinars, I hope everyone's seeing that you don't have to be the one doing the field work if you're not interested in doing field work as part of, you, you don't have to do field work to be part of marine science, right? So you can answer a lot of really awesome questions by running models and being really code savvy or computer savvy. So thank you, Victoria, for highlighting there's different ways that you can be a math major and work in science and marine science.